Good morning, and welcome to worship at Geneva Presbyterian Church, wherever you are, wherever you may be, welcome here today. All are welcome here. Just as God receives all who believe in Jesus Christ, Geneva aspires to be an inclusive congregation, worshiping, learning, connecting, giving, and serving together. We're grateful that you've joined our faith community for worship today. If you'd like to know more about Geneva Presbyterian Church, text the word WELCOME to 949-575-8675. You can also visit our website, genevapress.org, and download our app. It's called the Church Center app, and then you find our church on that app and connect with us there. We have a few announcements for you today. The first is a very exciting one. It's a concert for healing with the Pacific Symphony Orchestra and the Pacific Chorale this Wednesday, August 3rd at 6 p.m. in our sanctuary. Proceeds from this benefit concert will go directly to the Dr. John Chang Family Foundation and to the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Public Violence Fund. We hope you'll join us. We have a men's retreat coming up on August 12th through 14th. The deadline to sign up is August 5th, and we have some spaces for those of you who may be interested. We, uh, in addition to myself and our pastor, Steve Marsh, we have a few speakers who are hoping to spark some great discussion at this retreat around what it looks like to be men in an age of uncertainty. Uh, You can sign up online for that or by calling the church office. For the women, we have a great opportunity coming up, the Geneva Women's Summer Days Rally on Saturday, August 20th. You'll be hearing more about it in the weeks to come, but sign up begins this Sunday on our courtyard. You can sign up on our courtyard or call the church office to sign up as well. Secure your spot today. Space is limited, and it does fill up. This morning... I have the privilege to share with you about a new relationship our church has been cultivating with our neighborhood public school, San Joaquin Elementary. San Joaquin is a Title I school, which means it receives funding to help the many disadvantaged students who attend there. We've been welcomed in by the school's administration, including the principal, but recently I met with Ms. Thompson, who is serving both as a teacher 
and a counselor at the school. She was ecstatic that we've been joining them in their student wellness initiatives, like their community garden and their wellness room. Their upcoming and most recent project is a rehab of their library as a place where students feel welcome to go during breaks to continue their learning journey. Ms. Thompson wanted me to reiterate to you how grateful she is for our support. She sees the challenges many of these students work through firsthand. And it's through our faithful partnership that these wellness initiatives are being accomplished at such a rapid pace. And so, I'd like to invite you to participate in another way to serve San Joaquin Elementary School. Beginning tomorrow, excuse me, beginning Monday, August 1st, through August 24th, we are conducting our annual supply drive. This year, we'll be collecting supplies to benefit both the students and the teachers who have to buy their own supplies each year. You can check our website, genevapress.org, for an updated list. We'll also be sending that out weekly to folks on our email list. To participate, pick up items on the list and drop them off at the church office on Sundays or during office hours, Monday through Friday. Together, we can bless our community and help a generation of gifted students reach their God-gifted potentials. And now, let us enter together with a sense of the God-gifted abundance in all of us. Let us prepare for worship. As I begin our call to worship, I invite you to join me at the appropriate time. Sisters, brothers, and siblings, we have been raised with Christ to new life, freed from every fear and granted every grace. With songs of praise, let us worship God. Our Psalter reading is Psalm 49, verses 1 through 12. Hear this, all you peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline mine ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the harp. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of my persecutors surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches. Truly, no ransom avails for one's life. There is no price one can give to God for it. For the ransom of life is costly and can never suffice that one should live on forever and never see the pit. When we look at the wise, they die. Fool and dolt perish together and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever. Their dwelling places to all generations. Though they named lands their own, mortals cannot abide in their pomp. They are like the animals that perish. I will begin our prayer of confession. Please feel free to join me. Already assured that forgiveness is ours in Jesus Christ, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely that we might receive mercy and amend our lives. Holy God, you lavish us with good gifts, yet we persist in seeking after that which robs us of abundant life. We hold fast to our anxieties and give in to our greed. We desire the very things that harm us. Disciple-making God, hear our confession and those we now offer in silence. May we listen to you as well. Forgive us, purify us, and sustain us by the strength of your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thankful for the forgiveness given to us 
in Jesus Christ. Let me bless you. May the joy of Christ be with you. Go now, share and spread that joy to a world that so desperately needs it. Text a friend, call them, do something to let them know that the joy of Christ is available to all through faith in Jesus Christ. Let us continue in our worship of God. Our Old Testament reading is from Ecclesiastics, chapter 1, verses 2 and 12 through 14, and chapter 2, verses 18 through 23. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied by mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to humans to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun and see all is vanity and the chasing after wind. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to my successor and who knows whether he will be wise or foolish. Yet he will be master of all, for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun, 
because sometimes one who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This is also vanity and a great evil. What do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun? For all their days are full of pain, and their work is a vexation. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This also is vanity. Our epistle reading is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, enslaved and free, but Christ is all and in all.
One of my favorite international destinations is Tijuana, Mexico. I remember the first time I was invited on a house build uh, across the border as a young man. It was like we had entered a different world. Shanty homes, burning trash piles, stray dogs with missing patches of hair. This was not Orange County as I knew it. I remembered someone telling me before I left, when you go into Mexico, you'll be able to appreciate how good you have it back home. From what I was seeing, I couldn't agree more. I was so blessed. I couldn't wait to share that blessing with the poor in Mexico. When we arrived at the job site, we were told that the family receiving the home had two kids and they made less than $20 a day. Poor people, I thought. We started to build. Our team worked hard, but soon needed plenty breaks. People's nerves were tested here and there and the folks from America began to wilt in the Baja sun. Throughout the day, I would look over my shoulder and I would see the home's recipients. They were, they were peaceful, kind, hardworking. I saw others from the community who had come out to feed us, helping to nail, paint, showing us how to drywall. Always peaceful, kind, hardworking. The next day we ate together with the members of the local church commemorating our completed co-labor. These people, these Poor people of meager means were celebrating, feasting, joyful, laughing, telling stories, inviting us in as much as the language barrier would allow. And I began to wonder if these people in Tijuana were really doing us a favor by letting us pretend to build a house. With limited resources and, an, and unimaginable challenges, they were living abundantly. The gospel reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Listen to and for the word of God. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, friend, who set me to be a judge or, or arbiter over you? And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Let us pray. God, these words are strong in our world in which we live, of wealth and affluence, of uh, having plenty, it can hit us right where it needs to hit us. God, we pray, though, that in this time we would hear your grace and your mercy in them, but also that we would still be hit and know and be called to certain actions and practices that we might not know now but that you're calling us to today. God, open our hearts to your word and your words to our hearts, we pray. Amen. This morning, Jesus presents us with a very difficult word. You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is, Jesus says, 
with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. I'd like to suggest a good paraphrase of this passage this morning, and you'll hopefully bear with me as I explain it. Here's the paraphrase. Hoarding will kill you. Jesus isn't threatening us with this bit of news. He's declaring fact. He's saying that if you want to kill your soul, then take any gift you've been given and keep it for yourself. Take whatever abundance you have and keep other people's grubby hands off of it. If you want your soul to die, then say, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. It happens every time, Jesus says. Jesus isn't shaming us. He's, he's warning us. But this is where we can get a bit judgy. I know I do. I think of others who are in this situation, not myself. We, we can think of maybe how much more money we give away than others, how much more generous we are than those around us. And then, like the man in the story, we can say, relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But here's the thing. It's safe to say that this is not only about money. There are many more things that we can hoard. It's as much as about hoarding influence and leadership, hoarding emotional energy, hoarding the wrongs done against you, hoarding political clout and privilege, not to mention hoarding possessions. Hoarding, we're told by Jesus, will kill you. Jesus is the great physician diagnosing an insidious disease of our souls. Hoarding is a symptom of a greater disease. The greater disease is what we see in our passage. The word is greed. Greed is that urge to amass wealth of any kind to consolidate and crystallize my power, to build a mini empire in whatever circles in which I run. And it happens to the best of us. It often happens with those who have money, power, and influence, but the seeds of it lay dormant in all of our hearts. And because this isn't just about money, it can even be seen in those who are very generous with their money unsatisfied with our abundance or worried that eventually we'll lose that abundance. We fight at all costs to protect and build that abundance. But Jesus isn't telling us how bad we are. That's not his style. He's not piling on. He's not loading us up with guilt or shame. In this passage, Jesus is giving, giving the gathered crowd along with us the cure for this disease. What's the cure? The answer is one word. Abundance. When Jesus says, so it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but, not, but are not rich, Toward God, the Greek word for rich is also the word for abundant. And so, I'd like to suggest a bottom line for you today that we can jump off of, and that is this Jesus urges you and I to live an abundant life. This is the call of every disciple of Jesus abundance. But why? Why abundance? Because of these two treatments, the first treatment to the disease of greed is that abundant life is freely given and faithfully received. I still remember one of my childhood heroes yell at someone I loved, I am a self-made man. The ringing of this self-righteous declaration in my ears are really one of the only bad memories I have of this person. Still hands down one of my favorite people in all the world. This man grew up with the notion that success came through hard work and hard work alone brought success. If there was no success, it must mean that someone didn't work hard enough. This is really not 
what we're met with in Scripture. Over and over, we see that God's abundant blessing is God, God's to give freely, that success, however you want to define it, comes first and foremost as a gift of God. To Adam, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Jacob, Rebecca, Joseph, Moses, and the list goes on and on. Joseph Pieper, a 20th century German philosopher, speaks to this in his book titled Leisure on the Basis of Culture. He writes, We have only to think for a moment how much the Christian understanding of life depends upon the existence of grace. Let us recall that the Holy Spirit of God himself called a gift in a special sense. That the great teachers of Christianity say that the premise of God's justice is his love. That everything gained and everything claimed follows upon something given and comes after something gratuitous and unearned. That in the beginning, there is always a gift. End quote. Abundant life in its multitude of forms is freely given by God. It can be money property, possessions, but it can also be character, personality traits, good community. We must receive them as a gift. There are no self-made women or men. I'm really sorry to break that news to us all today. Everything gained and everything claimed follows upon something given and comes after something gratuitous and unearned that in the beginning there is always a gift. But this gift is always, always faithfully received. <laughs> it's a weird example, but the dream of winning the lottery still requires that you buy a ticket. <laughs> P.S. I'm not urging you to play the lottery, okay? What I'm saying is that you must act to receive any gift. That hard work, perseverance, determination, grit, all of these are summed up in the word faithfulness. You don't do this to earn the gift. You do this because God is a good giver of good gifts, and we receive them through faithfulness. We heard this from the Psalms today, quote, for he satisfies the thirsty and the hungry he fills with good things. Let those who are wise give heed to these things and consider the steadfast love of the Lord. End quote. Do you trust that? Do you desire to receive that? Well, we labor, we work, we create. We take the next faithful step to receive God's gifts. The gift isn't always wealth. Is it? it isn't always status. It isn't always influence. In other words, it's not always what we want, but it is there. Remember, the first treatment is that abundant life is freely given and faithfully received. But here is where the rub comes in for many. The second treatment to the disease of greed is this abundant Life demands that the gift be given away. We run into this truth spelled out over and over in Scripture. Having something is not the same as hoarding something. Having money or power or possessions is not the disease. Hoarding it is. If you truly want to enjoy the gift, the abundance, give it away. Jesus doesn't conclude his parable with, so it is with those who have treasures. No. He says, so it is with those who store up treasures. Take, take the early church, for example. Inconspicuously listed among the names of the poor in Paul's New Testament letters are the names of very wealthy people. 
Lydia from Philippi, a dealer of purple cloth. Phoebe, a benefactor of Paul's missionary journeys. The person, Phoebe, who delivered Paul's letter to the church in Rome, who was the very first human to preach a sermon on Romans. These women had money, but they didn't hoard it. And they weren't demonized for having it. Because they gave it away, they, they put it to work because abundant life demands that it be given away. And these very wealthy women were some of the first to get that. But the bigger thing was that they didn't hoard their social influence either. From what we can tell in Paul's writings, they weren't somehow some shadowy puppet masters pulling the strings. No, they freely gave of their influence to Paul. They followed him in his calling that God gave to him. But it was the poor among the people who also gave of their abundance. It wasn't just Lydia and Phoebe. They gave to each other freely, as freely as the gift was given to them. Are you starting to see it now? Abundant life does not come in making decisions in places of power. It doesn't come with getting rich. It doesn't come with acquiring property after property. Abundant life demands that you be willing to receive those gifts faithfully and give them away as freely as you receive them. Fuller Seminary has studied this phenomenon. They've seen this play out in churches where leaders hoard leadership. We're not just pastors, but uh, church members, when they hoard leadership, those churches decline. The same is true in each of us individually. And it's not just true in churches. It can be true in businesses. It can be true, true in your home where we hoard, we die. Fuller says there's a way around this, and they've seen it create thriving churches around the nation, safe to say probably businesses and homes as well. It's called keychain leadership. Keychain leadership refers to the way that the keys we have often indicate the things we are responsible for. I have a car key, a house key, and a church key. That says something about the places of influence and leadership and responsibility I have. Keychain leadership refers to the capacity to share or even give away the keys that we hold to others who are waiting for their chance to lead. It takes deep trust to share one of those keys with someone else. It, it takes deeper trust to give that key away and support the new keeper of the key. I'll be honest, and I know this, it feels way better to hoard the key. It feels way better to have someone rely upon me for something rather than me giving it away for the sake of what God's spirit is doing, even if that may be different from what I would do. But hoarding will kill my soul. It will kill the very thing I love. It will kill the relationships I hold most dear. If treatment number one is that abundant life is freely given and faithfully received, then treatment number two is that abundant life demands that it be given away. And so it is, Jesus says. So the question is, what treasures do you hoard? Maybe it's a wellspring of experience and wisdom that you can share with the next generation Maybe it's something that you oversee that you can graciously hand off to someone new and, and cheer them on. Maybe it's possessions or money. Maybe it's a glorious vision of the past that was indeed glorious and now needs to be adapted for today. What might it be? So why is Tijuana, Mexico, one of my favorite international destinations? Because when I go there and stay amongst the faithful followers of Jesus, most encumbered by wealth or possessions, I see abundant life. 
It is there that I'm reminded I don't really have it better in my home, Orange County. No, I have it better wherever the abundant life is being lived out, wherever the sweet cure of God's love and grace and mercy come into our spaces, wherever God's rule and reign invades our selfish, self-serving, building bigger barns to hold our wealth spaces, where there is abundant living. That's where we have it better. That's where there is the cure. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the cure. And we thank you that it is really a participation in your very nature. The God who does not hoard power. The God who asks humans to step in in the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible to be rulers, to have dominion, as you say. God, you don't hoard. And so help us, God. Help us see the places where we hoard our treasures. Help us acknowledge them, to be honest about them. And with the help of others who are faithful followers of you, God, help us to give those away, to be rich toward you and toward others, to live abundantly. God, we know this takes your strength and your strength alone, so we pray for your empowerment to do so. And for those who are right now living in true poverty, whether it be their financial situation or their health, whether it be their own sense of voice or lack thereof in their communities and in their neighborhoods, God, we pray that we would give away to those who truly are gifted with this ability to lead. Give them an opportunity to do so. Help us not to hoard those places, those who have been born into places of privilege and wealth and security. Help us to share that with them freely, the way you share freely with us. God, we pray for those who are sick, or even now in a bed watching this service. May your healing hand be upon them. May their lives continue to proclaim your praise. May others visit and present to them the peace that passes all understanding through their ways and their words. And may they know that you have not abandoned them, that you are there with them, the God of abundance. God, we pray for our leaders who often act and lead out of a mindset of scarcity and us as the people who encourage them to do so. God, we pray that you transform our minds from a mind of scarcity and a, and a way of thinking of scarcity into a thinking of abundance, a mindset of abundance. Help us to know that your gifts are abundant and ready to be claimed through faith. God, in all things, we give you praise and we ask you to work in our hearts and our souls the capacity to live abundantly as we pray together the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is our opportunity to be generous. To live abundantly. We've said it enough this morning. You know the call. My request to you is not to think that this is for someone else that you have in your life, that so-and-so needs to hear this message. Take it for your own today. I need to do the same thing. This was a hard sermon to prepare. It hit me. It cut me to the quick. Use this as an opportunity to think from your abundance how you can live abundantly for others. It's because God is good and the giver of all good gifts, and will continue to give them as you give them away. 
And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. Amen.